Bhaskar, thanks a lot. And uh, clearly, this was probably a very, very interesting and exciting session. Um, right after your session, uh, no pressure here to us and our panelists. Uh, we also um, have a fun session here for all our uh, participants. So welcome everyone uh, to our session today when we are going to continue to talk about future of work, but particularly in terms of future of learning and the current issues and opportunities that we have seen in organizations, in our respective organizations in terms of learning and how it is evolving. So with that, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, I am Gunjan Agarwal. I am the Chief People Officer of Ring Central. Ring Central is a unified communication and collaboration company which offers um, a communication and collaboration platform for enterprises. We are headquartered out of Belmont in Northern California, uh, and I'm responsible for the People and Places team um, of Ring Central globally. And with me, I have a very, very interesting and distinguished panel. Now I'm gonna ask each one of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, tell us a little bit about your role um, in this world of pandemic. Uh, what part of the world are you doing your role from? And uh, one interesting tidbit uh, to share with all, our, uh, with all our participants and to kick us off in a fun way. Uh, if you had one extra hour in the day, what would you do? So your role, where you are doing your role from, and one extra hour in a day, what would you do? I'm going to kick us off with uh, introductions, uh, handing over to Heidi. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm uh, Heidi van den Broek. Um, I work for a company called Terumo, and I more particularly work in the EMEA region for Terumo Europe. Um, Terumo is a medical device company, so um, we produce a number of, of, uh, of products. As you can imagine, the last year and a half has been quite a, quite a challenging uh, period, but also a very rewarding and gratifying period to be able to work for a medical device organization. Um, my role there is, is Talent Solutions Manager, which means I... Um, design learning experiences, recruitment experiences, or talent acquisition experiences, people analytics experiences, overall um, talent based in Belgium, uh, which is at the center of, of, uh, of Europe. So for me, it's late in the evening uh, today. Um, and if I would have one hour extra time, I would have a hard time choosing between the number of things but, uh, but probably uh, pottery would be one of the things I would, would like to do in the evening uh, because not, not a lot of time extra in the weekends is spared. So um, something creative, pottery, there's other choices too. Great, great, Heidi. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. And thanks for joining uh, so late in the evening there, uh, your local time. So Dana, over to you. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dana Hawley. I am from Mars. We are a CPG company headquartered in McLean, Virginia, and you may have had some of our chocolate products like Snickers or M&M's, um, use some of our pet care products, or perhaps take your pet to one of our veterinary clinics. I currently lead our global learner experience and digital innovation team within Mars University, which is our learning and development team for the global organization. I've been with Mars for about nine years now, and I am currently based out of our Hackettstown, New Jersey office. Um, and if I had an extra hour in the day, um, it would be tough. That would be valuable time. But I think I would use it to do more reading for pleasure, for sure. That's great, Dana. Thanks for sharing. Um, Tally, how about you? Where are you dialing in from today? Great. Um, great to be here. So I'm here from Atlanta, Georgia. And as mentioned, I'm with VMware and we're based out of Palo Alto. And VMware is a leader in providing multi-cloud services for all apps, enabling digital transformation with um, enterprises being able to have control of that digital transformation. Sometimes people ask me, well, what does VMware do and it's like when you think of your phone and your your apps on your phone the whole cloud of the infrastructure and the security and the managing and the networking that goes to support applications that you use every day 
that is what we do. We drive that through um, digital transformation. And specifically, my role is I lead a team of digital platforms and innovation. And we focus on creating a connected learning experience across VMware that we're really trying to simplify and create less friction and easy to find learning you know, just when you need it for our customers, our partners, and our internal employees. And one extra hour, Tally? Oh, <laughs> I do need an extra hour. That would be hiking anywhere. I love to hike, try new trails and new experiences outside. Yeah, I can't forget that extra hour. Thank you. Sure, sure. Wonderful. That's great. So that's phenomenal uh, from uh, pottery to hiking. I'm sure we'll try to uh, do some of these um, if we get an extra hour. Now, in the meantime, uh, while we are working, let me open up now the conversation with one question to each one of you. And uh, I'd love to have you share uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, broadly on the learning side, um, the key challenges and opportunities that you're facing, but also talk about what has been your biggest barrier to transforming your approach to the new learning and learner experience. So what has been the biggest barrier Obviously, talk about also the experience, the approach that you are following. Again, handing over to Heidi. Thank you, uh, Ganjan. Uh, let me start by um, sharing maybe a slide, an overview um, that might help talking through uh, a number of things. And I hope this works smoothly. So just let me know if you see the, the screen. That works. Okay. okay. Great. So I think one of the biggest transformational things at Terumo that we've done is trying to design, redesign, I need to say, the learning ecosystem that we have based on all the things that we saw changing in, in the world. Huh? Um, Edcast definitely played a role in that due to the platform. Huh? It gave an, a tremendous amount of, of possibilities and opportunities to our workforce. Um, this is a very busy slide, and I think that's one of the hurdles, um, covering all the different needs that there are out there in an organization, whether that's a, a personal need from somebody, a team need from a manager, or even an organizational development need from a full department. Um, um, everyone has their own purposes to learn. Um, I think one of the challenges that we faced, or, or uh, at least try to put the learner back into the center of it, um, really designing the learning experience around the learner needs. Um, that's definitely been one, one of the challenges because there are so many. Yeah? All, the, all the question marks bubbling up here in the center of the picture, looking at the different learner needs. It goes from a quick learning in the flow of work to really upskilling or reskilling yourself but also engaging a whole learner community. Um, gone are the days where learning and development was the center of learning in an organization. So um, I think looking at it and keep looking at it from an, from an ecosystem point of view where all the pieces of the puzzle try to fit together and ideally synchronously fit together, um, that was the, the aim of the game. And that was also really the, the change that we wanted to, to bring to the organization. If I can pick and choose uh, one of the, the biggest uh, challenges, I think, and, and that brings me to my, my next slide, is really redesigning that whole experience. And redesigning, putting everyone in a, in a, a framework and a mindset that you can't be perfect all the time. Um, what we did at, at Terumo is really try to listen to many needs in the organization in various ways, by serving people, by really uh, serving the managers. Obviously, our leadership team has played a tremendous uh, role in this. Um, closely following up the strategy, the business strategy, uh, the three to five years plans, and obviously with, with COVID, that changed a lot, but even staying in tune with all the agility that it needed and all the change it brought with us, um, using every moment basically to really attentively listen to what is the need and maybe even the need behind the need. So that's that's really what we've done. But then map it to okay, transfer to skills. What does that actually mean? 
Um, so what can we deliver and what can we bring? What type of products can we build around that? And then always trying to design the experience with a average uh, employee in mind, let's say, and whatever average may be in this case. Um, different target groups are out there with different needs. So trying to, to, to design as close we, as we can get to uh, a tailored learning experience for them. What we really did in a very different way than ever before is co-create that experience together with them. We took them in, in, in pilot groups for many of the products that we built, testing and trying small things out, asking feedback, continuously improving the product, and together with them, finding the best solutions. And it, it kind of breaks open that whole, we designed something and it needs to be perfect from, from scratch. Um, and because everyone's watching it and, and it, it just needs to work all the time. It does, of course, it needs to work, but it doesn't mean it can't improve along the way. And so the, the iterating processes that we've had and, and um, yeah, think with the end in mind, think big, but start small and build along, uh, build the road while walking on it. I think uh, that's a skill we've all uh, um, learned how to master uh, the, the last year and a half, um, definitely. So if I, if I can sum a few things up, and definitely not all the hurdles, but trying to cover all the needs at the same time, a lot of transformation um, for end the business and the workforce, but also for HR themselves. Uh, uh, all of us went through a tremendous amount of change, if only from yeah, the mindset itself and, uh, and the experience we wanted to bring. So um, very short introduction of, of what we've done, but uh, I hope it's, it's, it's a good uh, start uh, to answer the question that you had. Yes, very much, Heidi. Uh, so one quick clarifying question uh, for you uh, in terms of the um, ideating and kind of, you know, the uh, learning um, by doing. Um, was this in terms of the actual program, the learning program or experience that you were developing? So for example, how your manager training was uh, previously done, this new approach looked at that by gaining feedback and iterating. Is that how um, it worked? Yeah, actually on, on that type of product, but on all types of products. And um, also by the launch of, the, of our EdCast platform. So our learning experience platform, we baptize it Dojo, which is a, we're a Japanese company by origin. So it, it, uh, it says a lot when people talk about the Dojo and you bring things to the Dojo. Uh, there are sweats and tears and, and, and focus and everything in that story. And that's what that's the experience we're trying to bring in the end. So um, it's also introducing that we introduced a platform deliberately not to the, the whole population, but to small segments of the population, asking their feedback on the features, on, on the experience itself, on what it benefits did it bring to them. What value did they immediately see? What did they have to learn really? And, and, and what was maybe not so intuitive? So it was and on the platform, but also on all the, the different products, um, change journeys we designed uh, with a business uh, function, trying to upskill their virtual selling, for instance, or um, at the same time also installing peer learnings. And what does that bring uh, in terms of community building in an organization? Um, just started the uh, boot camp experience also uh, for really upskilling um, programs and, and, and let's say the, the building the muscles experiences much more. So different products that we have out there and building new ones as we speak, but always with the same state of mind, starting with a few things, reaching out to a community that is willing to share feedback and, um, and building it along step by step. It won't be finished. Maybe it will never be. Great, great, Heidi. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing. I love the dojo concept and I love the piloting. So that's really great. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dana. Dana, why don't you walk us a little bit through uh, some of the challenges in, in learning and the new learning transformation, as well as um, some of the things you'd like to share with our audience that your team has been up to? Absolutely. That would be great. All right. 
make sure. Um, so, you know, when we look at everything that's been happening at Mars and of course at, at many other organizations right now, we know that given the rapid pace of change that's happening everywhere, um, given the COVID-19 pandemic, we've really been facing unprecedented times. And so it's for really required us to take a look at not only how our workforce needs to adapt, but then as a result, how our learning team needs to adapt as well to meet these needs. Um, previously, we were focused on the much more traditional aspects of a corporate university. So think, you know, formal learning, classroom learning, of course, COVID accelerated that when we had the need to very quickly go virtual and digital. And it gave us a good opportunity to take a step back and really reflect on how our associates have transformed, how our overall workforce has transformed, and how we can connect as a learning organization to the overall goals and purpose of our business. So we know that currently our associates need solutions to their problems on the job. And Heidi, I was nodding my head along with many of the things that you spoke about because we're in this interesting space where associates need training on the job. They need to learn in the moment, in the flow of work. And there's also still a need for more broad upskilling and to really spend time to master capability and competency in some of the skills that are needed today. Um, we also are moving to a hybrid workplace model. So as a relationship-driven and principles-based company, we know that we will be working differently and we want to empower, empower our associates with the autonomy to work and to learn in a way that best suits their personal needs and meets the objectives of the business. So when we then take a look at that from a learning lens, we know that we need to meet our associates where they're at and help them from their personal preferences as well as the needs of their current role and their future development. So on the screen here, you can see a couple of different shifts that we've made as we've begun to evolve our overall learner experience. Um, we want to make sure that Mars University is set up to be dynamic, to be engaging, and really fit for purpose for our associates and bringing them the learning that they need. The first bucket here that I'll talk about is just continuous learning. So one of the things that has made us successful in the many transformations that we've had is the fact that our associates are really very willing to continue learning. They want to be agile. They have a lot of appetite for career development. That could be moving from different roles to moving different functions or even into different regions in the organization. And so we need to make sure that as an organization, we're supporting this continuing learning to help them keep up with the pace of change within our organization, as well as the pace of change, you know, in the industry. Um, we know that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 don't currently exist today. And so we want to set our associates up for success with that pace. The second bucket here, um, again, mirrors very closely what you talked about, Heidi, um, around just being agile and learner-centric in how we actually develop our learning solutions. So we've gone from being very focused on instructional design and focused on what the capability is that we need to build for our associates to taking a truly user-centric approach through design thinking and leveraging data and insights to ensure that what we're designing is actually meeting the needs of the associates, how and where they work, and based on what they're their needs are. Um, we then leverage technology that will enable us to provide that personal or that user-centric solution for them. We're also trying to be more agile as well. So doing quick pilots of things and tests versus rolling out much larger scale initiatives to ensure that we are meeting our associates' needs before we go full speed on the solution. In terms of social learning curation, which are the next two boxes that you'll see on here, this has been a massive transformation for us and has been very successful so far. As I mentioned earlier, Mars is absolutely a relationship-based based culture, and we have some amazing associates that just have a wealth of knowledge and experience both within the business and outside of it. And we want to capitalize on that diversity of experience and knowledge and share that out with our other associates. Um, as part of kind of the, the way of working within our culture, our associates are already learning from each other on a daily basis. So we've looked to say, how do we actually dial up providing some structured opportunities for that to happen so that it's more inclusive, that we can build some equity in it and have it available to all of our associates. And so we are formalizing some opportunities for things like peer coaching and mentoring, dialing up communities of practice and having associates share and learn through those, as well as embed it, embedding the opportunity for collaborative work within our formal learning and classroom programs, which of course will still always have a place within our learning portfolio. 
In terms of curation, we are tapping our subject matter experts and also our associates to help us gather and share all of the relevant content, right? The associates know best what they need and what they're learning from. They can quickly turn around and share with other associates that they can learn as well. It's allowed us to be more agile and to deliver personalized learning to our associates without having to go through a full development process um, and has really freed up time for our associates to spend learning versus searching for relevant content or waiting to attend a more formal course. Empowerment of associates is a theme that you see kind of throughout this. And so we really, you know, as our organization changes, we want to make sure that our associates know that we have a culture of learning. And that means that you're empowered to go out and seek the learning that you need when you need it. You no longer have to wait for development conversations or feel like it has to be something that's assigned by your line manager. It's really up to you to help dictate that and be really mutual in how we create learning and development for you in your role. And finally, that was easy. So from a, a services standpoint, we are actually organized as a shared service organization. And we knew that we had to make sure that we have a lens to not being just learner centric and how we approach things, but also user centric and how we serve the organization. And so we've continued to have a lens to how do we make the learning experience easy for our associates, which includes everything from navigation of our systems content, how easy it is for them to sign up to facilitate a course, to enroll in a course, as well as where and how they can engage with social learning solutions. So those are some of the, the massive shifts. Um, Gunjan, I know that you had asked about some of the barriers, um, and I think that they are probably similar across our organizations, if I'm, I'm guessing. So the first one for us is just time. So we are always getting feedback that given all of the transformations and all of the change and the pace at which the organization and everything, quite frankly, is operating today, that associates are looking for time to develop themselves. And so we've tried to build in that barrier to some of our solutions. So social learning, you're already connecting with other associates. You are already creating those relationships and learning from them, whether you realize it or not. So how do we make it part of the daily flow of your work for you to do the same and actually help others learn? Um, how do we make sure that as part of continuous learning that you're thinking about learning as an opportunity and a priority if you have an extra 10 minutes in your day so that, again, it's, it's really in the flow of your work. Um, I think another barrier that we run into as well is just as we go through all of these transformations from a change management standpoint, making sure that learning is part of some of the other initiatives that we do and some of the other transformations going on in our business so that it doesn't feel like a standalone thing that's being pushed by our HR department or pushed by Mars University. We want to make sure that we're kind of weaving a common thread of learning as an enabler to many of our other transformations and initiatives throughout the business. Got it, got it. Dana, thank you so much. So some uh, clear themes already between what Heidi said and, and you're sharing in terms of uh, agility of, uh, of learning and kind of that approach. Um, and then the barriers in terms of time and, uh, and lack of knowing where to find what. So trying to provide it right where the person needs it, um, as well as uh, trying to make it uh, more integrated rather than this being a disjointed effort. So that's very, very helpful. Um, handing over to you uh, now, Tally, to share uh, some thoughts uh, about the uh, barriers to learning, um, as well as uh, what you guys have been doing at VMware. Tally, okay. you're, you're I on. realized I was muted. Got it. Yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Hopefully you can see it. So yes. first, wanted to, before we talk learning, although learning is such an integral part of future work transformation, as we all know, we're passionate about the field that we're in and supporting transformation. So at VMware, one of our key tenets is we realize what's possible. And through the shifts and the things that have happened in the last year and a half, two years, I, I love some of the tenets and the primary aspects of our work culture. That one, like I said, we realize what's possible in everything we do. Our approach is flexible. We know we have a global distributed workforce. We want to provide workplace options. Well-being is at the foremost of everything we do and how we make connections with one another and leading with digital first as well in our work practices. Um, the future of work, you know, it's going to maybe look different. We already had amazing, if any of you have been to our Palo Alto, Palo Alto campus, we have amazing collaborative spaces, but we're also using this time to even look at all of our office footprints and how we make those spaces even more collaborative. 
Um, so when we do return, you know, we have even more chances to do that. So I wanted to mention that and learning at the speed of SAS is one of our challenges. So I'll speak to that for a few minutes. We at VMware cross cloud services for all of our apps is one of our primary focuses. And we are moving very fast through digital transformation and the technologies that we're bringing forward. So how we can get that learning to our employees, to our colleagues quickly is paramount. We want to leverage AI. This is, these are some of the reasons why we went with the EdCast platform, I should note, in our business case, you know, to procure the platform. And so AI, how we can get information distributed to groups quickly um, through our mergers and acquisitions of bringing in systems. We want that presentation layer. So it's a seamless experience and the learning catalogs are presented in an effortless way, you know, straight to the learners. And then I mentioned AI again, because the AI is going to surface the learning and bring that unification. Mentioned throughout this event, skills, reskilling, personalization, a global workforce is mentioned. And also we have a lot of signature events in the particular area that I support for our partners and for our customers, our employees. So we want to immerse our signature events into the learning experience platform and um, they can resurface like it might be a worldwide kickoff event but then we structure it with an EdCast before the event, after the event, and then we can you know, get most optimization of that content. Also, as mentioned, Anywhere Workspace for our employees, that's actually a tenant of VMware that we can deliver our services on any device and any cloud. And that holds true to our learning as well. We want to bring our learning into Salesforce, into Teams, into Slack, and through mobile devices that's personalized and curated. So this is our business case, and we're you're just chipping away on all these things and I'm uh, very excited about what we've been able to achieve, you know, with EdCast. This is a small picture of creating this connected learning experience that we bring everything, you know, with a learner in the center, um, learner in mind in the center and have it personalized for them. And I know we're running short on time. We have branded our application VMware Learning Hub. I also noticed LinkedIn Learning branded that Learning Hub recently as well. But and um, when we took it to our branding team, we described what the EdCast platform was going to do for us. We branded it as a hub because it's bringing so many things together. So we were excited about that. And we can access it, like I mentioned, on our mobile devices as well through as our, we have a Workspace One, which uh, makes it really easy to consume and go into the application anywhere. And quickly, this is a glimpse. We're launching, I think somebody, I think Heidi, you mentioned this, that we're, you're launching through Pivotal Events, um, small pilots. We're doing a similar approach. We are launching right now through some of our signature events and work transformations are knowing our corporate story, our corporate narrative. We're launching a corporate overview um, task to everybody um, with some different audiences. It's going to be really big across sales and marketing. We are focusing on solutions enablement for our sales and field enablement. And then, like I mentioned, we just had our sales university and we were able to create really beautiful um, spaces based on your role and the day and the track that people can access um, this amazing content. So more to come as we launch, but I've really enjoyed launching through strategic transformation events and very specific initiatives. I think that's helped us and, you know, work out some things before we're fully launched across the whole organization. And um, okay, I'll turn it back over to you, Genjin. Thank you so much, Dali. In fact, I'm going to um, stay a little bit longer with you and ask you a little bit more about uh, your approach to uh, the workforce transformation. So you've kind of hinted on it a little bit, basically trying to have learning available to people wherever they are. Um, we do know that you've had a, a you know, uh, work from home, um, you, as all of us, uh, scenario. So my question to you is, uh, what are you continuing to plan um, in terms of changes um, as part of your going back to uh, office strategy? That's a great question. And I think it's something that everybody is considering. The good news is we're very grounded in our company's ability to run, manage, connect through our whole digital infrastructure. So we had a lot of things already in place. So that's been helpful. I think we've been really looking at our colleagues and our employees, like how do we not oversaturate, I would say, and try to be very specific when we do bring content forward, making curated experience. I know that was mentioned, not overwhelming people with too much content. 
that we make it very meaningful and targeted in what we're going after as an organization. In our workspaces, we're following, I mean, the guidelines. VMware has been fantastic. We're very much employee choice, employee first. We're not doing anything until local governments lifted restrictions. We have local leaders connected to all the local locations. We actually look at the data of any health risk in our very particular area. So we're using guidelines, you know, around data before we would consider, you know, going back into the office. And then also just looking at overall physical and I would say readiness of the locations that we can support the safety and well-being of the employees. So right now, I think we're just focused on bringing a digital first strategy. How do we best um, bring the information and that connected learning experience through di digital mechanisms and then, you know, we'll consider, like I mentioned, the ways that we'll bring people back into the office. And again, focusing on collaborative spaces when we are, whether it's collaborative spaces digitally now or when we're back together, which, you know, that'll be exciting to be all back together again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think digital first, that's kind of the first part of the approach. And the second one, which I'm also very interested about, and I'm going to um, throw the question out to um, uh, Dana or Heidi, whoever, uh, you know, would like to um, pitch in here. The other part is the social learning bit, right? So, um, so digital first approach, starting from digital, then kind of finding a way to... Um, uh, so that basically democratizes and enables learning to everyone. The second part is, um, I would say, a little bit of the uh, curation and the social learning part, right? Like, how do you continue to engage people when they are all over the world, basically, and would love um, either Dana or Heidi, whoever, you know, raise your hand and would love to get your thoughts on it. Sure, um, I'm happy to jump in first and Heidi would love to hear your perspective as well. Um, I think for us, for, for social learning, you know, I, I talked a bit about empowering our associates and I think that's really gonna be key to our strategy. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have so many talented associates and so many skills and, and diverse knowledge within our organization. And so we want our associates to be able to, to drive this social learning movement themselves. And so we've really looked to balance the structure and the, the formal opportunities for social learning along with the informal opportunities. So we've recently launched our own kind of social learning hub where associates can go and actually get all of the toolkits and information to launch their own social learning. So it doesn't have to come from this big, you know, company pushed initiative and associates actually are empowered to say, hey, this is something that my team could, could work through. And as we, you know, get used to working in a more hybrid model and for our teams that are global that have been in a hybrid model for quite some time, this really allows them to connect and learn from each other um, through whether, it, you know, the curation or a community of practice that they decide to start up um, to provide those opportunities. Hi. Great, thanks. I think the only thing that I can, and, and very similar data again in, in, in stories, but um, also, next week, in fact, we're, we're uh, launching our hybrid um, working model, too, in the, in the entire EMEA region. For us, social learning is really uh, also the type to, not only for, for managers who need to lead this uh, transition, of course, but also for, for, uh, for our employees to really connect to each other and see, okay, what is difficult here? Um, how... How can we learn from each other to do things in an even better way? Um, so really um, getting the social learning out there and on the platform, um, definitely by being able just to share um, certain content uh, towards each other, um, but also just in practice, uh, putting up some peer learnings together. At the same time, um, we used social learning as a, as a format to really redesign our workplace. Um, we've launched in, in springtime a huge crowdsourcing idea um, momentum for people to help us redesign the workplace as they wanted. And that really created a lot of empowerment opportunities and, and small projects going on in the organization. Um, so it, it's, it's beyond learning. It's, uh, it's, it's all learning, but it, it, it goes much wider than, than that. Um, yeah, so that's maybe an, an, a different uh, point of view. No, that's a great point of view, Heidi. And actually, um, I'm going to pivot and ask um, um, uh, Dana an, a question on that. But before that, I just want to remind our audience that if they have any questions, please feel free to send those through over to us. 
um, through the chat uh, button, and we will try to spend a few minutes uh, answering your question uh, questions as well. So uh, you talked about uh, Heidi. Uh, you talked about um, doing this, uh, you know, kind of an iterative. Uh, process to really get uh, feedback on workforce, uh, workplace transformation. I know Dana at Mars, um, you have actually um, a, a global VP for workforce transformation. So are there any learnings, um, you know, that you have, um, uh, as your organization has seen from this role and the creation of this department that you could share with everyone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think when when the organization started to look at workplace transformation, obviously it's a, a massive undertaking when you look at a, a company our size with the number of associates that we have and, and of course, globally and across the world. Um, so we really knew that it would be key to have this agile cross-functional team assembled um, that could represent the diversity within our business and allow us to move really quickly. So as we, we kicked off this work and then as kind of COVID-19 came into play, we knew that we had to have a team that was looking at all of the different data points and that was being really robust and user-centric because ultimately we have to have a workplace transformation that reflects what's best for our associates and our workforce. Um, so this really allowed us to have this holistic view to all of the changes that were being made and understand impacts that are happening globally or within different functions when decisions like this are happening. So can you share for the audience um, like an example of data points that um, that were, uh, you know, that were helpful or proved um, insightful maybe even? Yeah, absolutely. So I know that the um, some of the data that was looked at was how associates are actually leveraging our different tools right now. And those tools could range from our brick and mortar office buildings and when are associates going into them, what's really purposeful and what type of collaboration is best done in those. And then looking at data points around our digital tools and when are we leveraging things like Microsoft Teams for collaboration versus for one-on-one -on -one meetings. And so really looking at that data across, again, our, our global organization, looking at it across our different functions and understanding then how does that roll up to some of the, the bigger decisions that have to be made on behalf of the organization. Got it, got it. That's very, very helpful, Dana. So I think um, the question I would have for all of you as you are thinking about now, uh, you know, this whole um, hybrid uh, way of working, uh, how are you going to evaluate um, what's working, what's not working? How would you prioritize? What are the things that you would focus on going forward? Because there's so much going on. So maybe uh, we start with you, Tally. Sure. That's on the spot. Yeah. Like you mentioned, digital first is our one of our North Stars, but simplification and not like I mentioned before, not overloading our employees with too much, which actually the EdCast platform is going to help us have more visibility to everything that's being shared across the groups, leveraging data of what consumption is happening. And also making sure that we're working on the things that matter to our leadership, to Ragu, our new CEO and our leadership team to really move our, we have a theme for our kickoff sales kickoff this year was called forward together. And that really resonates well, because when you move forward together, you know, you're going after the same mission, the same North star, the same, you know, strategy. And so that feeds into learning. So I would just say, you know, really focusing on those things that are going to move us ahead. And for me personally, in my job, how do I best bring that learning to our, our teams, to our managers, to our employees, and then do it in a, the most simplest, you know, frictionless experience possible? Got it. Great. So forward together and trying to work through that, right? Um, so we have a couple more questions and I would uh, post, uh, ask here the question that we got from Vikas, which was really interesting, which is how do you approach um, early professionals versus experienced professional hires? And I think particularly the early professionals, I feel uh, with being, uh, you know, uh, remote, a lot of our employees, I'm sure yours too, joined completely remote. Early professionals probably find it a little harder um, to integrate. And um, how have you guys thought about early professionals versus, of course, experienced professionals as well on the learning side? I think I can I can pitch in on that. Yes, um, yes Katie. 
A couple of things. Uh, in, a, in a young talent program, really designing a learning journey from, from scratch, onboarding them into an organization, but also onboarding them into, let's say, um, the starts of professional life. Uh, the do's and don'ts and, and how the interaction with managers go, what the expectations are around that. So for the very, very, very basics. I think the wonderful thing about launching a, an, an employee experience platform is that it's exactly that hurdle of different maturity levels in an organization that you tackle without even too much thought behind it. Um, you design for purpose. And I think the word has been mentioned uh, a couple of times. Uh, is it a very skilled person? They can take on different roles on the platform and outside the platform. Um, you, can, you can easily um, bring on board the youngsters, uh, let's say, somebody transforming from the one role to the other, completely reskilling. Um, if you have the right journeys or, or pathways installed, then that shouldn't be a, a big thing to, to really onboard them well. Um, so it offers a, a, a wealth of opportunities from, from where I'm sitting in, into uh, different moments that matter uh, when it comes to the professional life in general. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what would my answer be. Um, so what, go ahead. Uh, Tali, you want to say something? Yeah, I would say we also leveraged, um, did a pilot with our new grad academy, jet graduates coming directly out of college, and we use EdCast to both the group's functionality and integrate it to Microsoft Teams because they had a team space. And along with Heidi, we created like a learning experience for them specifically. And it, we, <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine this, but we actually used they had used smart sheets before to kind of organize their day. And so the transformation was huge. And we got really great feedback from the college grads using the platform and using it, the mobile device. So great, great. That's great. So I see we have, I think the next panel now uh, hanging out with us. So we're going to make it uh, even more interesting and engaging for them <laughs> to, to pick up a few nuggets from us. So there is a question from Wajid, which is a really, really good question. Um, and the, I, I'm going to say the question, but I also want to um, it also like triggered a question message behind the question or like a question behind the question for me, which I'm going to throw at you guys right now. Uh, what was your experience around trying to build a buy in by the end users around new ways of learning, right? While we are democratizing learning and making social learning and empowering people, how, um, how did it land? And uh, uh, were there any challenges and how did you overcome those challenges? And I think the question behind the question, like what triggered for me was like, uh, what is, uh, you know, sometimes um, there you may come across um, uh, uh, thinking that, you know, there, is it a learning culture? Is it a growth mindset uh, broader in the organization? Or is the learning, has the learning typically been approached with the perspective of saying, okay, if I do this, then I will get a promotion. So like, is the learning from a growth mindset perspective, is a learning from actually getting your job done perspective, is a learning from actually getting somewhere in your career development and, uh, and move. So we'd love to get your thoughts on that, actually. And Vajit, thank you so much for this question. Um, I'm happy to, to jump in on that one. Oops, sorry, Heidi, do you want to go? Um, so I think for, for us, we definitely have a growth mindset in our organization, which I think makes it a little bit easier to, to get buy-in for, for some of these transformations. For us, it's more around the what's in it for me, right? And just looking at it from a traditional change management standpoint and understanding for all of our stakeholders and for senior leaders in the business, why should they embrace this and why should they help to empower their associates as well? And so, you know, we're able to look to some of the success stories that we've already have, and we're very much in the, the midst of this at this point in time. Um, but for us, it's about enabling associate growth and development, which benefits all of our leaders as they're able to tap into talent across the organization that they might not have otherwise had visibility for, you know, if it wasn't for things like social learning. Um, and so it's really just kind of matching up learning and development opportunities with what their biggest needs are within the organization. Now, Heidi, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. And I think I was, I was going to echo that completely. On top, I think it's and, and, and all of the above that you mentioned. For whatever their reason is, for whatever their purpose is, 
there's plenty of reasons to learn these days. In fact, what, what would you do if you wouldn't learn? Um, so the learning platform is definitely there. And, and if you need to build buy-in, then I think you need to culturally do other things first, maybe, um, and have, have good discussions with leadership teams. Um, because these days, there's hardly a burning platform needed for uh, stimulating learning in an organization and, and, and bringing that growth mindset uh, um, and exploiting it via the different learning opportunities available. So, yeah. Perfect, perfect. That is such a great note to end our session and hand it over to our next host. Um, having a growth mindset, but more importantly, what you said, Heidi, that reminds me of that funny joke, right, that used to go on LinkedIn and on the internet about um, telling, a, you know, uh, the CFO saying, hey, you know, if we spend all this money and what if people leave and they are the chief people officer or learning officer, whoever saying, what if they, you know, they don't learn and they don't leave. 